Hello everybody, my name's Adam and welcome to the Python in 5 Problems video series. Now this information was originally presented as a live workshop, but in this series we'll break it down over several videos and the main purpose of these videos is to help teachers get started with coding in Python, specifically to meet the expectations of the grade 9 de-streamed MTH1W curriculum. Now a few things to mention here, first of all I recommend that you watch these videos in order as each one builds on the previous concepts. Also, um, this is a teacher resource, okay? It's not meant to, uh, to be for students, it's meant to help teachers get started with Python, and then you can take these ideas and use them in your classroom as needed. And I'll also mention too that on the BHN Math website, there is a, uh, a reference guide available, it looks like this, and that has several purposes. One is um, you can use it to kind of move ahead quickly in these uh, in these video sessions. If you don't want to move at my pace, you can move at your own pace. Um, but also in the future, if you need to refer back for any reason to some of the syntax just to see how something was done, uh, that's a quick and easy way to do so. So let's get started here. And we'll begin by answering some general questions on coding. And the first question that we'll take a look at here is the big one. What is coding? Well, really, it's just writing instructions, specifically writing instructions that can be understood by computers. And that leads to uh, another question. Why would we ever want to do this? Why do we code? And of course, there are several reasons. Uh, first of all, just to communicate with computers, to communicate with the machines that we're using. Uh, to solve problems, coding gives us a great way to explore, explore mathematics, explore other things to help us solve problems. It allows us to do many, many computations uh, very quickly. So to solve problems, to program the technology we use every day, everything from you know cell phones and microwave ovens to the uh, to the websites that we look at, they all involve some coding. Uh, and to make our lives easier, there's a great quote by Rob Miles who wrote uh, a, a book that I've referred to frequently called Begin to Code with Python. I'll talk about that a little bit more in the future. But in that book, he said, humans can do complex things rather slowly. Computers can do simple things very quickly. It's the programmer's job to harness the simple abilities of the machine to solve complicated problems. Yeah, so making our lives easier, taking you know what these machines are good at, which is doing simple things and using that to uh, to help us solve problems, make our lives easier and uh, help us solve you know <laughs> complicated issues. Now that leads to perhaps another question. How do we code? How do we actually do this? And the basic answer to this question is we use something called a programming language. So humans think in a certain way and computers think in a slightly different way. And the purpose of a programming language is to make the link between these two things. So we can think of a programming language as a translator between how we think and how the computer thinks. Now let's take a look specifically at that grade nine MTH1W D-streamed mathematics course. A few things to keep in mind here. We are coding for mathematics. It's a mathematics course. It's not a computer programming course. So we should be using uh, coding to solve math problems. Now coding, of course, can be used to solve a bunch of different problems, but we should be focusing on math because this is a math course. It is in the algebra strand, that is coding, is in the algebra strand of the curriculum. Now I say sort of here because if you actually look at the overall expectation for coding here, it says uh, apply coding skills to represent mathematical concepts and relationships dynamically and to solve problems in algebra and across the other strands. So we're not just talking about the algebra strand, we're talking about all the other strands too. So this expectation is is pretty big, you know, it's bigger than it, uh, than it may appear at first. And last but not least here, there are three specific expectations uh, that we should look at. And there they are right there. So we have um, the first one, which is talking about using coding to demonstrate an understanding of algebraic concepts. The second one is, uh, is talking about creating code and specifically doing that by decomposing situations into computational steps. So, you know, you always hear this, this thing, if you really want to understand something, try teaching it to somebody else. Uh, we could also say, if you really want to understand something in math, try coding it, because you really do have to be able to break it down into steps and really know what's kind of going on uh, underneath it all. And the last one here is uh, to read code and also to alter code. So we'll see examples of all these things in, uh, in this video series. Now let's talk about why 
we're using Python. I mean, there are several languages out there. Scratch is a very popular one that's being used in schools, specifically in elementary, and I think a lot of people are using it in the grade nine course as well. But uh, in our board, we're going with Python. And of course, you know, if you, you can change your mind on that, but why would we want to use Python? Well, first of all, it's a text-based language. And in the curriculum, it doesn't specify that we have to use a text-based language. Um, the curriculum <laughs> doesn't really specify much at all, does it? But uh, if you attended any of the ministry webinars um, on, you know, implementing this curriculum, they made it very clear that uh, a text-based language was to be used, uh, at least for the goal, uh, the, the end goal here. So this is a screenshot from uh, one of those webinars where they say create code using a text-based program programming language. So uh, pretty obvious there that that's what the intention is. And here's another uh, screenshot from the same webinar in which we get a little snippet of code uh, right here. And we can see that, yes, this is definitely text-based. It's, uh, it's Python right there being used to solve a problem. So yeah, it's text-based language. So it aligns well with the, the ministry's expectations. Uh, furthermore, it's the next step from elementary. In, in our board, at least, we have a lot of um, students and teachers using Scratch in, uh, in elementary schools. And that looks like this. It's called block coding. You, you drag and drop blocks, and then you kind of fill in the details of the code, and you hit, uh, you hit go, and something happens. You know, something moves around the screen or whatever, and it's, uh, it's adorable. And that's what's happening in our elementary schools. And the logical next step uh, when students get to high school, I think is to to take off the training wheels and start using that text-based language um, that uh, that is being used in the real world for coding. Uh, it's user-friendly as far as text-based languages go. Python is great, and and a big part of the reason for that is that uh, the actual syntax is very similar to the actual English language. Uh, it's useful for future coding, whether it's future programming courses or a career uh, in programming or something else that involves coding. Um, Python may be used. It's, you know, it's used with a lot of big companies. But even if you don't use Python, if you have experience using Python, um, you can then easily transfer those skills to other languages, uh, whatever they may be uh, in uh, future situations. It's a fresh start. One of the biggest concerns I hear from teachers is, well, if students have been coming from uh, you know a background in coding through elementary school, they're going to be able to code circles around me by the time they get to high school. And if you're using Scratch, that's very, very possible. Uh, however, if you make the switch to the text-based language here, uh, chances are you'll be on a, a level playing field with the students. In fact, you, you might be um, a little higher up because you, you're familiar with the mathematical content more so than they are in most cases, but uh, it's kind of a fresh start and you can, you can work and, and learn together uh, with that. It's easy to access. It's completely free. Uh, it can be downloaded and installed. Uh, it can be run, you know, through a browser and very easy to do. We'll talk about that later. And there's tons of support out there, whether it's through YouTube videos, uh, through online forums, lots and lots of support. A quick Google search will get you an answer to any question that you have. And finally, there's um, several guiding principles that I kind of always have in the back of my mind when I'm thinking about coding in the grade nine course. And they are these here. First of all, keep it focused on math. And I'll say it again, this is not a computer programming course. It is a math course. We should be using uh, coding to solve math problems to help students better understand mathematics. Uh, highlight the value of coding. Don't you know, why, why would we use coding for something that really doesn't require coding? And I'll go back to this example here from the ministry webinar. Personally, I don't think this is a good application of coding. So obviously what's going on here is we have a pattern and we're supposed to use code to help us um, figure out how many triangles there are at a specific stage. Now, if you look at it, you know, stage four has eight triangles, stage three has four triangles, uh, sorry, six triangles, stage two has four triangles, stage one has two triangles and so on. It's a, it's a very simple relationship. We're just doubling the stage number to get the number of triangles. So if you want to know what's happening at stage 150, well, just double it. It's going to be 300 triangles. We don't really need code to solve that problem. Now, of course, if you're just you know using this as an example to get students used to syntax or whatever, that's fine. But I, I think we should be really highlighting why you'd want to use code, and that is to do things that uh, would be uh, very difficult or extremely tedious otherwise. Make it problem-based. Um, I, I love the idea of let's introduce a problem and then uh, 
and then we'll use the code to solve it. Now, if we don't know the syntax at that point, this is how we can introduce it. Well, how are we going to solve this part of the problem? Well, we need to know how to do this. So let's talk about the syntax needed to do that. So making everything kind of problem-based and introducing the syntax on an as-needed basis, right? And you know, the last thing anybody really wants is to sit there and go through all of the, uh, the different types of syntax that would be needed to code. Just introduce it as needed. So we're really focusing on the math and the, um, the code needed just to solve those problems. And choose the best tool for the job. I personally would not be using Python to do anything involving graphing. I don't know why anybody would really. I mean, if, if you just go to <laughs> GeoGebra or Desmos Online, uh, it's so intuitive that students and teachers wouldn't need any instructions uh, there. So it, Python's probably not the best tool. Now, it can be done, and it can be done uh, very nicely in Python. Just take a look at the work of Grant Sanderson at uh, 3 Blue one brown his YouTube channel there. He uses um, Python as the foundation for what he does, and there's some amazing looking stuff. But for the sake of this course, I think that uh, if we can find a tool to do a job better than Python, we should, we should use that tool. Okay, moving on here. Uh, before we dive in, just a few more quick things here. First of all, maybe you know this, maybe you don't, why, why we actually call this Python. It's actually um, called Python because the developer, uh, Guido Van Rossum, loved Monty Python's uh, Flying Circus. He was a huge fan of, of Monty Python's Flying Circus, so it's named after that. Uh, it's kind of interesting, some trivia there. The reference guide, I, I've already told you about that. Now, if you take a look inside that reference guide there, you'll see uh, stuff that looks like this. So what's going on here? Well, first of all, we have the actual problem at the top, and this page is dealing only with this problem. Down the right-hand side here, you'll see some snippets of code related to that problem. On the left side here, you see, well, there's a light bulb icon here, which uh, kind of gives us the big idea of what's being addressed in this snippet of code. So for example, here we're calculating and printing a value, and the next one we're rounding a value and so on. And it's always presented like this. Now, the code snippets might not be down the right side. They might be kind of across the, the middle of the page or something like that, but there's always this information on each page. The little stars here are talking about um, ideas that are being introduced in this reference guide for the first time. Okay, so you can see there's quite a few of them at first because it's the, it's the first piece of code we see in this manual. So we have a lot to talk about, but as we move through the manual, it's just um, little additions being made. And last but not least, this exclamation mark here is just giving you uh, a little bit of a heads up as to something you might want to be aware of. So that's uh, that's what the reference guide is like. And of course, you can use it um, to move ahead in this series at your own pace uh, and also to, uh, to use as quick reference in the future if you need to look something up. Moving on here. I'm not a pro. I'm not a coder, just so you know. Um, I have some coding experience and not a lot with Python, more so in uh, GeoGebra's um, coding uh, language, if you want to call it. It's called GGB script. Uh, but a lot of the ideas are similar. So I will likely make mistakes in these videos when we learn from them. You know, when Python sends back an error, we, uh, we learn from that. And uh, it's quite possible that if you have questions and you ask me, I might not know the answer right away, but I guarantee you I will look it up and we'll, uh, we'll solve any problem that you come across uh, together. I recommend that you play and practice a lot. That's, that's how you get good at coding. That's how you get good at mathematics is play around with it. So yeah, find yourself a nice comfortable place to sit down with your computer and try things out, you know, mess things up, fix things, get those errors, see what's going on. And uh, I guarantee you, you'll have some fun with it. I certainly have. And embrace the challenge. You know, some of the material you see here might be overwhelming at first, and some of the things that you try to program uh, might might seem really challenging, but embrace that. And I can tell you, it certainly feels good when you do hit that run button and everything uh, works for the, uh, for the first time. So embrace the challenge. And ask lots of questions. You know, anytime you want to contact me, I'm happy to help out. And like I said before, there's a lot of uh, great resources online. Now, before, uh, before we get into the uh, actually looking at Python, we should talk quickly about some of the data types that we'll be using, the first of which is numbers. This is a math course, so obviously we're going to be using some numbers. I just want to mention there are different ways that um, 
Python interprets or represents numbers. One of them is integers, and we're familiar with those. Integers in Python are exactly what we're used to. You know, 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, negative 1, negative 2, negative 3, negative 4, the integers. Um, but there's also another type of data called floating point numbers. Now, for the purpose of what we're doing here, you can just think of floating point numbers as decimals. Now, why do I have that little warning sign there? We have to watch out. Uh, Python doesn't always represent real numbers exactly as we input them. And that has to do with the way that Python stores, uh, stores values. And in particular, it, it will always try to kind of store the value in a way that is as close as possible to what we've input. Uh, and that can end up giving us some uh, some weird kind of rounding errors with the uh, with the display. So I'm just mentioning that because, for example, if you type in um, 0 0.1, it'll and display that it'll actually display 0 0.1, and it looks like there's no problem there. But if you type in 0 0.1 plus 0 0.2, you'll see that it gives you a weird result, and we'll see this in some of our examples. We expect it to give us 0 0.3 but instead it gives us something like 0 0.3000000004 or something like that. And that again has to do with how Python is storing that, uh, that number. And it's storing it in a way that is as close as possible to what we've, uh, what we've input and what we're expecting. So just be aware of that. Now, it doesn't really matter for what we're doing. It's not going to come up, but I just wanted to mention it in terms of, uh, you know, if you, if you see something weird like that, uh, which we will actually, we'll see it. It doesn't have any impact on our calculations really, but you'll know what's, what's going on there. And the only other thing I wanted to mention here are strings and strings are really just that they're strings of characters. And we often use strings to deal with uh, text sentences and words and so on. Um, and that's another type of data type in Python. Now there are several others too. There are lists, there are tuples, there are others too, but in this series, we won't get into those. Perhaps we can do that at a different time. So let's go. Uh, now, what do I mean by let's go? Let's take a look at where we're going to do our coding. Now, you can download Python from python.org and install it and so on, but I am not going to use that in this video series. Instead, I am going to use uh, an online Python compiler. So I'm just going to open up Google Chrome here and I'll show you how to get to that. So if we go to uh, just we could just type in Python online and that'll take us to a bunch of uh, search results here and the one that I like to use is right here it's the first one that came up it's uh, programis.com the online Python compiler you can try the other ones I'm sure they're great but I like this one for several reasons uh, one is I like the way it's kind of laid out we have our our section on the left here where we'll, we'll build our program and when we hit the run button, we see the results over here in the shell. Now, just a little heads up on what shell means. A shell is, uh, what, what it does is it kind of takes our input and delivers it to the so-called Python engine uh, that, does, that does all this stuff in the program. And then it gives us back a result, which we also see in the shell. So it's really like, it's a shell that kind of encloses Python. And a good analogy, again, from Rob Miles, is uh, a shell is kind of like, a waiter in a restaurant. Uh, the waiter takes takes your order, so the waiter's like the shell, delivers it to the chef in the kitchen, which is like the um, the Python engine. Chef prepares a lovely meal and then gives it uh, back to the shell, the waiter, who brings us that, uh, that finished product. So that's kind of what's happening here. Now, some things I like about this, uh, you can click this full screen button here and that will get rid of the ads at the top. You can also switch to this dark mode, which I like using, I think it's pretty cool, but for the videos, I'll keep it in, in the lighter mode here because I think it's probably easier to see. Um, I also really like that we can zoom in. So if you hit control plus on your keyboard, or if you hold control and roll the mouse wheel, uh, you can zoom in, which is going to make things easier to see in this video series. But also if you're putting this on a screen for your students, it will uh, likely help quite a bit in allowing them to see things clearly. So that's what uh, what we are going to do. So the next video, we're going to dive into the first problem. This one was a little bit lengthy here. We had a lot of stuff to get out, uh, out there, but uh, I hope you enjoy the series. And uh, yeah, good luck with the first uh, the first problem. Take care.